it going, everyone? Happy Wednesday. Greetings. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for the 31st episode of the Downtime Game Podcast. Each and every week we bring you some news, little bits of reviews and our thoughts on the latest and greatest in the world of the board games, video games and absolutely anything else fun you can do in your hard-earned downtime. With that, as always, I'm your host Sam Angolini and joining me across the airwaves once again is the one and only Chris Horzo. How's it going, man? Yeah, it's good, man. Mm. It's good. Yeah. Man, Do you know, I just yeah. realised, man, that uh, this what? podcast is going to be the same age as us when the birthdays come round. Oh, is it really? Yeah, I don't know if you just noticed that. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, I just, I just clicked and I was like, hang on a sec, 31st, what happens in two weeks? Oh, uh, yeah. That's true. <laughs> what a lucky coincidence. <laughs> I, in no way planned whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah, no, we, we really planned 33 weeks in advance. Just, uh, yeah, that's a level of dedication that we had to this. No, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 oh, no, just something to do that we've stuck to, really. <laughs> yeah, it's going all right, it's going all right. I like to think we've got something useful to share, yeah, occasionally, some stuff. Yeah, we've got opinions, people need every to hear two or three. <laughs> every two or three weeks, we say something like actually profound. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I like to think that half of what I say is profound. <laughs> Profoundly <Thank> bullshit. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. good. It's my job as the editor to remove the other half. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a really good week, man. Yeah, I've actually had a great week for it. Yeah. yeah. Parts of that project have moved forward, which have made my life easier. Nice. I've uh, definitely gone and treat, treat yourself. Treat yeah. yourself. My series, uh, stuff. my series X arrived. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot to ask you about that. Yeah. I'm so wrapped up in other stuff. How are you finding it? Well, it looks really pretty. It's a yeah. lot heavier than I thought it was going to be. That has got some weight to it. That is a chunky it's monkey. A chunky, chunky boy. Did you like mm-hmm. opening the box? It's like, like, oh. it's like opening a chest in The Legend of Zelda. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's so unnecessary, the, the, the care they've put into the way that's packaged. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love a good bit of box uh, design. And you'll hear me talk about box design later as well. But I love a good bit of box design. Like, the way the whole thing felt. It really did yeah. feel like a present when I was opening it up. I was just like, okay, well, you know, like the way the labels were, like the labels have got the little bit where you actually pull them as well, which is already not stuck on. I'm like, mm, the yeah, attention the to detail was just so good. Even yeah. like the fact it had a little like cardboard envelope over the console. I'm like, yeah, power your dreams. It's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah. Thoroughly enjoyed opening that box. Yeah. Ten. How was the setup? I have not finished setting up yet. I end up having quite a busy weekend. So I I basically realised that the new TV stand I bought doesn't actually fit the console. So the console <laughs> now sits off slightly to the side. Amazing. Which I don't really mind. Like, you know, the, the TV stand needs to be done. I don't really want the console to get damaged by the fan being blocked. No, no. So the next couple of days, I'm going to be finalising all of the admin that comes with it. <laughs> and cool. It doesn't take long. It's, it's fine. Honestly, I, look, for the entire back compatibility... If I have one day of admin to cover the last seven years of game zone, perfect. That is that is a great time reward to ratio. I mean, yeah, it doesn't, to be honest, it doesn't even take that long. As I, I think I text you to say, like, you've got stuff on an external hard drive, right? So all you do is plug that into the new one. And, that's like, and then any, anything with a Series X patch, you have to transfer onto the hard drive, like the internal SSD. But everything else, you just leave on the hard drive and it just works. Very I, easy. I mean, for me, this is going to be a chance to clean house. Like, I do deinstall uh, yeah. games so often, but I was like, actually, this is now the time to really, like, very cutthroat. If it doesn't sit yeah, on yeah, external yeah, yeah. and it isn't a Series S patch or Series X patch, it doesn't need to sit on the Xbox. Get rid. No, exactly. And anything you might want to play soon, just open, like, that has a Series X patch, just open, and it will kick it to do the update because some of them are quite big. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know you struggle sometimes with that, with the updates. Like, obviously, like if you're playing Gears with Dan on Thursday or something, don't open it on Thursday. Like, open Gears now and get it all done. I think the only games I need to worry about was Ori, Sea of Thieves, Gears 5, and probably Warzone. They're probably the only four that I think I need to be worried about. But then I can start getting myself the medium. I was like, yeah. Yeah. I think the Falconeer, I've not tried yet. That's got this Series X version. So I'm like, okay. I really want to play that. Uh, Yeah. I'm proper down for it as well, but I was like, because the console is so soon, I've been sitting there on the console games, just yeah. building them up. Fair enough. You're going to get some cool. quality content in the next month. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I've had, yeah, as I say, I've had one in this 
like the medium was the first real game that came out for it. But it is good to have like the extra power to just make everything else slightly better, like slightly more interesting. Not interesting, but like I think it's, it's load time. I know it's weird. It's load time. It's all load, load time. Times. Yeah, yeah, having no load times on Assassin's Creed. Like sometimes I'd just be like, click fast travel, and then I'd just be instantly like across the map because it it just happened to be that bit it cashed in, I guess, and it was absolutely amazing how well, quick it is sometimes. I, I've been playing a lot of Gears Five. I ended up having a session with a few guys, and we had people on PC, people on Series S, and then me on the Xbox One, and it was so noticeable those load times. You know, yeah, it's. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the thing I'm looking forward to getting rid of. And it wasn't that bad yeah. until you literally had crossplay being what it is. Now I know how yeah. bad it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The old ones are so slow compared. Mm-hmm. And then it can go sit there on my vintage video game shelf and just go live up there for a while. Job done. Yeah. yeah. Put it out to pasture. <laughs> it can sit there alongside the GameCube, PS1, the Wii, and do all those other consoles that. Yeah, they don't need to be played anymore. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah, so I've had a really good week for it, man. Yeah, definitely treat yourself all round. Yeah. Treat yourself. Nice. Cool. Yeah. So what's going on in your world, my friend? Uh I I know this is this is like a dumb little thing, but I should definitely should have gone first and we should have had your game thing leading into more game things. But what I learned <laughs> slash I think I already knew, but what I more, mostly learned this weekend is I I thought I hated gin for like 25 years of my life. Turns out, I just absolutely despise tonic. Like tonic water is just... The worst. Dirt. It is so bad. So I've had like some like gin and sodas and stuff over the weekend. Delicious. Loved them. So a nice quality gin. Great. And uh, whoever has been, you know, big tonic has been pushing gin and tonic for decades. Like They've done a well good marketing campaign, but I, I, I thought I hated gin and tonic. And I do, but I hate the tonic bit and not the gin bit. So tonic is the worst. Me. It takes tonic everything. Sucks. It honestly, it takes everything about water, everything about carbonated beverages, and makes them both worse. You know? Yeah. Why is it so awful? Like it, it's like it's like you drink you drink it and you get drier. Like it doesn't make any sense. It just tastes awful. It's just like weird. It's like gone off sand. Anyway, interesting though. Me. Interesting that you're now delving into the gin world because that is a big world. If you go to Aldi, their gin section just grows and grows. Yeah, no, I've got like some of the Brewdog gins, and I've had some for a while because Hannah likes it. Um, I dipped in a bit like over the summer because they are quite refreshing. But yeah, now I this this weekend I guarantee because I ran out of soda, and then for my like second gin, I used gin and tonic, and it was like appalling. I literally couldn't finish it. So it is 100% anti-tonic water now in this house. Good. And soda. Soda's fine. It's just like a bubbly water. Just put add that to stuff and it's so much better. Get yourself a soda stream and then make your own. No, that's too much effort. <laughs> I'll be back on the beer before long. So this, just, this is temporary. Shall we move on? <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Let's dive straight into this week's top video and or board gaming news. Each week we're selecting two stories that we think are interesting and worth discussing and we'll bring them directly to you. Fine people. So this week, the top video game news. I think we should do video game first because it's probably going to be much, much shorter. Have you heard of a little experiment called Stadia? I I, I may have Google done. Google Stadia. I, I may have this... done. I'm pretty certain that's next to Zune and it's next to Apple Music <laughs> and all the other things that don't work. That Apple Music's a thing. People like it who have iPhones. I should, say, I, I should say iTunes. iTunes no longer a thing. But Apple oh, Music yeah, is. iTunes, yeah. iTunes, iTunes sucks. Um so there were like a bunch of little stories this week, but the, the, the biggest one really was Google announced um, in Waves. So firstly, they announced they are shutting down all internal development for Stadia games. So they last year or the year before, whenever it was, when they launched Stadia, they bought a bunch of developers and, and, and hired like over 150 developers, like individual people, developers to come in and make games specifically for Stadia. They've just canned the whole lot. So they're all gone. No more internal development, no more work for those poor people. Um, like if, it is bad every time these things happen, like 150 people being laid off sucks. But I do like seeing on Twitter, like community managers and other studios reaching out and like the first, the, the top like five to 10 tweets 
our other studios would be like, hey, if you're affected, like reach out here or, you know, reach into our press office. We've got jobs going here, here, here. So like it is that sort of, you know, dev camaraderie, which is cool. But this is just crap. Like they didn't they didn't publish a single game. Like they or no, they didn't. They that was that there was that one exclusive, but I don't think that even came from Stadia's developers. So this is obviously just the first step in what everyone thought was gonna happen and that's gonna be Stadia getting shut down. Yep. Yep, yep, it sucks. It sucks, man. Yeah, because the guys who did Journey to Savage Planet were one of the development teams taken on by Stadia. Yeah. And I really like that game, obviously. So really unhappy to see that that's, yeah. that's probably been nailed in the coffin. Yeah. And it's not like all those people can be like, oh, okay, well we'll just we had a studio. Like we'll just go we'll just go make a new studio. Because like without funding and without everything, it's completely different now that they've been bought and released. Now they're just like 30 people without jobs. <laughs> it, it, it really does suck. And it, yeah, as I say, like this is 14 months after Stadia's launch, apparently. And they've just like did the dirty on everyone they snapped up. So that sucks. And then, and on what they thought was positive news, I guess, uh, Google announced that more than 100 games are coming to Stadia in 2021. Yeah, 100 games. Which is really bad. Really, really bad. If you imagine like people with Xboxes, which don't get all the games, let's, yeah, let's use Xbox because you just bought one. Uh, like they don't get all the PlayStation exclusives. They don't get a lot of the PC stuff. Like just someone with an Xbox. There's going to be way more than 100 brand new games this year. You're going to have way more than 100 things to play. And they're all brand new. But things coming to Stadia, you're going to have old stuff, indie stuff, plus some new stuff mixed in. Like 100 games, they probably thought it was a really good announcement. But then last year they announced more than 120 games coming to Stadia in 2020. So they've lost 20 games somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Check under the floor. Check under the sofa. They've got yeah. to be somewhere. <laughs> it's absolutely shocking. And um, yeah. one, of the big, one of the big things, like one of the main headline games on this more than 100 games post was FIFA 21. It's been out six months. And nobody's buying a FIFA game six months old. At full, definitely at full price. It's like fifteen quid in Tesco, and probably not been. And for game when playing yet, online, that you have to be so precise on what's happening. You know, like yeah, if there's exactly. an input lag, I ain't playing FIFA with any input lag. Are you kidding me? No. Yeah. Oh my god! Let me tell you, weekend league servers. If there's any sort of lag, and like a like a tight game, and lag can lead to somebody scoring a goal and you losing the game, it is possibly the most rage inducing thing I've felt in gaming in a very long time. It was absolutely horrendous because you just know there's nothing you can do about it. Like you, the game lags; it doesn't t- accept your inputs for like it can it can be three seconds. That's the thing. It's an annoyingly quick paced game, and then you know one tackle, one through ball without you being able to move your players, and then they've scored, and then you lose like two one, and it just feels awful. Not so, acceptable. Yeah. No, exactly. And I mean, I mean, it might be great. It might work great, but you, you don't want the newest FIFA six months after it comes out. As they and don't forget, like these aren't coming to the service. Stadia isn't a subscription service. Stadia is you buy these games. So if this comes out even full price for a week, that is bad. And that is like one of the top eight like things on their splash page for top games coming this year. They're just they're in they're in trouble. There's there's no way this lives, right? Can we be honest here? Twenty twenty was a great year for gaming. For the industry as a whole, a lot of the industry managed to survive working from home. And a lot of people made money in the gaming industry because all of a sudden people were stuck indoors and they needed indoor hobbies. Brilliant. Digital gaming, absolute boom. And Stadia have failed in a year where every other gaming platform has done well. That says it all. That says it. You can't even blame COVID. You can't blame the industry. That just sums up that the product was not a good product. I give it another 18 months before we officially hear about it dying. I don't think it'll be dead in 18 months. I think that'll be the announcement. I mean, it might be a good product. It was just priced terribly and nobody wants to use it. But that's part of the product. You know, if you've not changed the pricing model in 14 months. That's, okay, that's fine. Yeah, like, come on, come on. If you know that this isn't selling, do something about the pricing model. Yeah, like, change it. Don't don't fire all of your first team development. Like, that is really, really... Yeah, I, I, honestly, it's dead. It's dead. Speaking of people making money, while I remember, and you said people making money, um, Remedy, the developers of Control, who I've mentioned a couple of times recently. Your new favourite developer, yep. 
my new favorite developer. Uh, they made like twice as much money in 2020 as they've ever made, and they didn't put out a game. <laughs> 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 like people love Control, and Control mm-hmm. was like way more successful in 2020 than it was in 2019, apparently. And uh, all the Alan Wakes and everything, yeah, they made twice as much money in 2020 as they ever have. And the last official game release was 2019, so that's crazy. And you are right, in that ecosystem, if you come out with like an entirely new platform when people want to play games and want to spend money in the right places, then Stadia just doesn't deserve to t- live. That seems harsh. No, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't deserve to live. It's just like, whoa. yeah, I don't know. But saying live, like human connotations that's, that's pretty bad but i mean the as a product are, it doesn't deserve <laughs> to stay live <laughs> the people that work there probably deserve jobs somewhere else but the, the in general the studio should just go it's really bad to stream x cloud is free with a game path that's the thing this is the thing they just and we all now. knew it was poorly managed before it came out it was poorly managed after coming out <laughs> it's just what what can you do like i feel sorry for the developers and the risk reward must have been there. They must have known this is always a possibility, but the reward was good enough oh, to risk yeah, it. Yeah. And it sucks that that risk didn't pay off. You know, they probably got really well paid for fourteen months. Yeah, which isn't great. But yeah, I, I, like, I like to think they made sure you know that that deal was in their favour. Yeah, I mean, it would be sh- shit. It's Google. I'm pretty certain any Google contract is going to be so ironclad that. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, they they pay quite well though, to be honest, compared to like other game developers. So. Not that that matters. Like you'd rather have job security, especially in the middle of a global pandemic. It's just it's just frustrating. Like I've got a few friends who work in game development and for different publishers, and they've all had really good years. You know, they've had like one of my friends. I'm not going to say names or places. One of my friends is no, telling no. me that their Q3 was better than the last every Q3 to date. And you're like, I didn't release any games in Q3. Same with Remedy. You know, just people yeah. were buying digital games more so, which meant they got a better profit than they had in previous years. Yeah, it's been wild. It's it's mad. Like this is a great time for video gaming as a hobby. And yeah, then somehow just, just not off your stadia. <laughs> <laughs> just not off your stadia. It took oh. a golden pill and messed it up. Uh, I'm not. I'm not it's gonna die. I'm not it's gonna die soon. It's gonna die soon. I feel bad for the developers, but it is yeah. Yeah, yeah. As I say, like I wanted to like start that with saying like a lot of the Twitter stuff was you know, offering people jobs or offering people like resume lists and, and open positions and that stuff. So hopefully they're all fine. They're, as you say, the guys who made Journey to Savage Planet, Journey to the Savage Planet, they're talented guys. So hopefully they get picked up. Um, but speaking of digitalness, moving into the board game world, sort of, board game arena, which Ooh. is the, let's say, third biggest, might be biggest, I don't know, like third biggest in my mind of the online board game implementations like Tabletopia, which is the one I guess we use the most, and Tabletop Simulator, which is a Steam game full of mods of just rife with pirated content. The board game arena is like the most official one, uh, and it has been purchased by Asmodee, the tabletop giant that owns everything. <laughs> like, they Chances own, are, can, if you like something, Asmodee are yeah. owning it or have touched yeah. it. Yeah. If you if you if you have played a mainstream game, they own it. Uh, they own the studios behind Catan, Pandemic, Ticket to Ride, X Wing, Arkham Horror, and uh, many many more. So, Ball Game Arena is the the it's like the most lo fi version of these online implementations. Should we say it tries to just do it just does like card art and two D. And it just looks like a tabletop and it just runs well because it's just art and 2D. Whereas Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator go the other way and they try and like render physics and 3D environments and you can chuck things around and roll and dice properly and all that kind of stuff. So it's the, definitely the most simple one of those. Not only that simple, but you know, simple looking. But it favors kind of like the old school board gamey person, I guess, that doesn't need flashy stuff, which is maybe why. Uh, we prefer the other two because you want stuff to look good if it's going to look good, you know? But anyway, this this is, the, it's not about that. This is about, this is so interesting. They're like one of the biggest games publishers or is it a publisher? A company of publishers. They own all the publishers. They're designers, publishers, company. Yeah. They I, own I, like I don't even know what they are. So much. They have the, like a huge monopoly on like the North American. They're the Amazon scene. in the board game world. That's the only way I can yeah. describe them because they've just got fingers in every pie. Uh, yeah. 
maybe Disney. I said Disney of the North American board game world, which like spreads out as well. They own quite a lot of like other companies. Um, so let's go through. This is who Asmodee owns: Zygomatic, Catan Studio, Fantasy Flight Games, Days of Wonder, Repost, Lebelud, Space Cowboy, Z Man Games, Power Games, Edge Entertainment, Plaid Hat Games, Astari, and Lookout Games. Which, yeah, if you have seen a board game in a mainstream shop like a bookshop for the US people like Barnes & Noble or here in Waterstones or a supermarket, then chances are it's published by Esmodee. It's insane, <laughs> or, man. Or the publisher is owned by Esmodee. It's absolutely insane. Like that, that list alone, just from a gateway game perspective, that's to Carcassonne, it's it's all to Tickets of Rides, it's, that's it's, to it's all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're Every right, game that's been recommended for the last 15 years to get someone in the hobby is owned by Esmodee in one way or another. It's It's mad. This, this whole decision, I, I, I get Asmodee's perspective and I see why they've done this. But, oh, my days, it's a convoluted mess trying to work out is this a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there are more than 5 million registered board game arena members now with the number of online players and communities growing by 600% during 2020. So they were like quite a small operation a couple of years ago and it's just uh, you know a couple of guys started it. And now they've grown into quite big, as these things did, or a lot of these things did over the pandemic year. But you're right. I don't know how to think about this. Like, if they just, you know, keep a free subscription and drop all the Asmodee games on it, like, great, it's good. More people can play these games. But if we start to see less and less of other publishers' stuff on a service that people liked and used, that's bad. And then because they've got this official place for their games, if they start going after Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia, online, other versions of their games and, you know, actually filing ce- uh, cease and desist and things like that, then that is also really bad. And it's hard to say which way they'll go, but I think it's going to go in the really bad way because, I mean, Asmodee have a front as a, you know, oh, board game publisher, they own these things, but really they're just a huge, like a company run like a business, which is weird to say in the board game world, but like they're actually a business and they just own all these board game publishers, which even the biggest designers are like, you know, <laughs> kind of like indie operations right there there are so few that you would consider a business if it was in another segment if you if you know what i mean like the the the, the teams are like three or four people at most like there's the collaboration is small like the board game world is still so tiny and insular but then asmodee have come in with you know almost a asset manager kind of way and they've just tried to run it like a an outside business and uh, it's ri- ri- like ruffled all the feathers of board game people, but you know them snapping up studios and laying people off and moving product from one studio to the other to try and speed line, uh, to try and streamline things. Like they've they've made a lot of money doing regular businessy things in a in a kind of a growing sector that didn't really have businessy stuff to start with. You know what I mean? I'm trying. I'm saying you hit, them, you, you hit the money in the head. Growing sector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As much yeah, as we yeah. talk about board games, it's a growing sector, and these guys have seen an opportunity because they've got like investment backing. No, I think Asmodee have been yeah. sold twice now to different investors. So yeah. all of these things are just classic corporate structure and corporate moves. Yeah, in an industry that's, that's that has like, no yeah. corporate <laughs> ability, you know, yes. like you, yeah. you said it. You, yeah, you said it a lot. You you refined what I was trying to say, but yeah, they're, they're just doing. It. Yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, they're just doing regular business stuff. But for people in this almost incredibly ho- hobby driven space, you'd be like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Uh, like people are kind of, you know, reticent to get on board with the Asmodee train. But yeah, you're right. The fact that they own like essentially every gateway game, every game that you're going to see in a supermarket or a shop, or you know, you know, people say like, oh, you know, I play Monopoly with my family. Like, what should I recommend? And you, you, you know, your first things are, as you say, like Carcassan, Catan, Ticket to Ride, uh, Dominion. Like they own it all. Like <laughs> they own all of them. Like they've they've very strategically gone after these things where they can make the deals. Like, and it is a very professional way to look about it. So. Which is a very long roundabout way of saying, I think they're going to absolutely ruin Board Game Arena. <laughs> I don't well, know. Ruin it. I don't ruin it, but they're going to ruin like everything else. Like They're going to make it impossible for like the um, fan-created mods on TTS. They're going to go after Tabletopia implementations. They're going to rein in a lot of their stuff from other platforms. You know, imagine if Asmodee were like, oh, we've got this platform now, so we want everyone to take their fan created content and images off of BGG. Like that just doesn't cripple BGG, but it kind of ruins about twenty percent of it. 
And they could do that. They could be like, BGG is just a fan-made site, uh, board game geek for people. Um, they could just say like all of these fan-made mods and box inserts and images and stuff like, I mean, you're discussing our games, just you need to take it down. Like, they could do that. They have the money and the weight. And now they've got a platform to put their own stuff. What's to stop them stifling others? I'm going to hit on a couple pros and a couple cons because yes. I think, I don't know. I don't know. I'm still on the fence if this is a good thing or a bad thing. So I'm just going to yeah, just throw it out there. So I'll start on the pros. Digital X-Wing. A, an actual platform to play Digital X-Wing would be amazing for the hobby, would be amazing for the people involved in that, and would be amazing for all those other miniature hobbies. You know, We've talked before a few times about how you can implement it. But just from a business point of view, if you had that great digital implementation, somewhere you can push people towards that keeps the product lines alive during this COVID world. It increases engagement because now people can play it in different ways and certain people like different ways of playing. There's, oh, there's so many ways you can make it better by having a single location for digital games, for everything. You know, imagine when it came to like Catan Worlds or Exxon Worlds, all of that on, being in one place. Brilliant. Before you move on, before you move on, before you move on, let me counter your first point and before I let you get onto the next bit. Um, like, Board Game Arena is... I wasn't joking earlier, but it is like a proper 2D interface. It's just like cards and stuff. I really, I don't see how you could put like a X-Wing or an Armada or a miniatures game in something like this. It would just be, I'm moving my oblong over here. This is you know? phase one. Let's be honest. The, yeah, I, maybe, I guess... if they, maybe if they improve it, maybe they improve it, but they can't just slot X-Wing into this as it is. That's the thing. Like they would have been better off buying the TTS mod if that was their intention. But you're right, carry on with your point. My, corp- my corporate hat <laughs> says to me, this is phase one. Phase one was just the acquisition. And you're not just buying it for its existing users, you're buying it for that future plan and future growth. We've been saying about how they're going to go full corporate on this, and that's exactly what they're going to do. And the pros of full corporate means that you like to think someone's planned the next two, three years of engagement and acquisitions yeah. to get more people on it. If that means kind of rewriting some of the scripts or upgrading some of the software, fantastic. Again, this is why I'm on the fence because it could go. It could go so many ways from here, and I'm, so I'm not part of Asmodee's acquisition strategy. I don't. I don't know. I work for a company that lives on acquisitions, and I've seen acquisitions go fantastically where both parties benefit, and acquisitions go the extreme opposite, where you think, "Why have we acquired this?" So it's just yeah. it's similar to what I do for a living. So, anyways, so that's a potential positive here. The other positive being, if you can then bring all of your online and organized play for those gateway games, like Catan's got quite a big online structure, you can start bringing that all into a single place, bosh. You've now consolidated users, you've now increased people who would be interested in those tournaments. There is that kind of added value for people who play those games. That's all great, in theory. The cons, the cons, the cons, the cons. All of the content that was made by the fans means those fans are probably getting shafted right now. I'm really happy for the two guys yeah. who built up that system, got it to where it is, because they started doing it as a side project initially, and then that took over their day jobs. And it was really interesting reading, I don't know if you saw the couple of Reddit threads, where the actual mm. owner and the guy who made Board Game Arena, he was summing up exactly what led them to where making it in the first place, how many challenges they've had, and why they've sold. Really interesting to read, honestly. Check it out on the subreddit for Board Games because it was really interesting, that insight. Full of corporate speak, obviously. You read between the lines when you're reading that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, they can't. Yeah, yeah there'll be stuff in contracts to say they can't speak about certain aspects of the deal and, and what's going exactly. on. Exactly. Like, you have to take that with a pinch of salt when they're really positive yeah, yeah, about yeah. the acquisition. Yeah, I'd be really well, positive if someone's giving me <laughs> crap loads of money for my website. So well done, well done for him, seeing an opportunity, developing it, well done. building it up and selling it on. Fair enough, man. That's, that's what you've got to do in business. You either live with it forever or you sell it. Yeah. But what do you feel about the fact that they've created the framework, but they, you know, these two guys didn't make any of the games, right? Maybe they, maybe in the beginning. That's a con. Yeah, yeah, they created the board game arena framework and then fans and other people created the games within that framework. And it's those that are popular and it's those that have basically got them bought. They, they just, you know, they're YouTube, you know, at at, at, at arm's length, they're YouTube and, People are uploading really good content to YouTube and people like the content, but people don't necessarily like YouTube, but it's YouTube that are making all the money, if you know what I mean. Like it's that weird relationship 
yeah, now they're owned by a huge publisher. What does that say about, you know, if somebody comes in with a small game, they're not going to, maybe they won't let them upload it anymore or, or make changes to it. It's, it's weird. Every person who's made content for that website to see it improve and see it get better has basically been given the finger. And that's the bit that I don't like. You've, you've abused all of your content creators to get you to where you are. And now it's a bit like, oh, yeah, thank you very much for helping me out that one time. See you later. You know, I'm going to take my golden ticket and all the work yeah. you did for me, it doesn't matter. You know, like, I'm going to forget about you in a month. That I, that I really didn't like. That, that's the one that's probably not the wrong way. But what else can you do? I don't know what else they could do. That's the business model to get where they are. Yeah, and yeah. It, su- it sucks. It sucks. And we were right, though. And now the negatives of being a corporate monetization how is it going to go you know we've been talking about monetization a lot in legends of rune terror saying how that's a good implementation of a ccg and good monetization in in a digital format which is really awful for monetization are they just going to look at this as a great opportunity to now rake in extra money from board gamers who tend to have a bit of extra capital it's an expensive hobby yeah you know oh i don't oh, i are going to monetize it and I'm really not looking oh, forward absolutely. to that. Yeah, yeah. There'll, there'll, yeah, there'll be premium subscriptions or it'll be like Ticket to Ride base game is free, but then all, every map, every expansion map will be like a couple of bucks or something. Oh, they'll, they'll which figure is how it's, it's done on it console. Right. Ticket to Ride on Game Pass, you got the base game, the American yeah. version, and every expansion was like another three, four quid. It's so, uh, yeah. I mean, the, their apps are really bad as well. Like The majority of the yes. Asmodee apps are terrible. Yes, um, which doesn't bode well. But then the Poor Game Arena framework's already there, so they don't actually need to develop it. It's weird. It's weird that they've that such a big publisher has come in and bought one of these, not underhand things, but just like a place where people put games for free for, for other people to play for free. Uh, it's really going to change the online dynamic of, of how these are played, I think. Uh, but we've got absolutely no idea uh, how that's going to play out, Yeah, I guess. I don't think this is going to be the first move for a board game publisher to buy one of these and i'll be interested to see who follows suit because you know they're essentially leading the leading the charge here and someone yeah, else is going to see really, it works yeah there's only really two others and who else is big enough to buy tabletopia or tts i'm guessing there are smaller ones like there's like a like azul for example there's actually a website where you can basically play azul as somebody's made oh, themselves no, there, yeah, there's, there's loads you get so, all yeah, these yeah, weird I mean, little things like the... that there's options here there's it's the ones that eighty and XX and stuff like that, but as far as like mainstream, like actually worth acquiring, there's the main three, right? And this, I mean, this could simply just be down to SEO as well. They feel like Board Game Arena is a better Googleable term than Tabletopia, which is why they bought Board Game Arena. Like, it could just be as simple as that. The whole thing's concerning, but it's too early. <laughs> the whole thing, like you know, I, I, the sky could be falling, or actually, the sky could be exactly the same, and I don't know. So I'm just going to watch a space and yeah, sit there and I hope it doesn't impact TTS because I'm going to be honest, I think TTS no, yeah. is the best of the three. But TTS is, has a monetary cost to get involved in the first place. It's pretty computer heavy. Like it does abuse your resources because it's badly optimised. And yeah, okay, yeah, don't get me wrong, all the mods are definitely pirated to hell. <laughs> I think... I think t- I think you're right. TTS can be the best. Like with Tabletopia, you know you're getting a set quality because they are publisher backed tts it could be the like the the greatest ever mod with automation that people have created or it might just be crap that's the thing like you don't really know because it's just steam workshop like normally the good stuff floats to the top and and the crap sails away but at least on tabletopia you know the the game will work (laughs) but you're right tts is really good did you see um somebody did a complete reskin of wingspan Using Pokemon. Yes, I TTS. did that. Oh, was yeah, actually yeah. on TTS. Yeah, oh yeah. my and god, that reskin looked amazing, man. That person every put single so card. Much and there's hundreds of cards, and they put them all in Pokemon, like with relevant Pokemon for the relevant powers on the bird cards as well. Uh, th- that must have taken hundreds of hours of work. He was saying kind of cool it took him, he did take him hundreds of hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and then he made cool mistakes stuff. that he didn't like, see. Yeah. And people fix it, and or people tell him to fix it, and then he fixes it, and it's all just free on Workshop. And uh, I, I can't remember if Elizabeth Hargrave commented it or not, but I mean, it's the kind of thing that's like the really cool fan made stuff that you really hope Asmodee don't just come in and crush that sort of innovation. But it's kind of their prerogative if they want to. That's the annoying thing. So we'll see. 
we will see. I mean, let's be honest. We're talking about season desist, and we've mentioned both Nintendo and Disney today. <laughs> both of those companies are notorious yeah. for doing season desist. Oh, they love it. They so, love it. Like, love but the thing is, like, they've not bothered in the board gaming space. I just don't think there's enough money in it. Now, is there <laughs> enough money for Asmodee to do it? You know, have those, are, those companies must be aware these things are happening and must have gone, it's not worth spending the money to do this. Maybe we find that Asmodee can't do a season six because it's just not going to pay off. I don't yeah. know. I mean, yeah. a, a C&D is like completely free. They could just send someone a letter and hope they stop. It's only if the lawyers get involved that it costs money. But You say completely I do think... free. It depends on actually getting the lawyer to draft the C&D in the first place. You know? No, I could do it. I could send you a letter and just tell you to stop talking about something. Are you just... confident you can do a nice C&D? Nah. Yeah. nah yeah, that, 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 like, you could draft the letter, but a lawyer is going to have to send it off just to make sure that it's been signed off in the right way. Yeah. No, but look, to, to what, to just scare some kid who's uploaded a mod on Steam it doesn't have to be legit at all. And then only if they challenge it, you get the lawyers in to shut them down. That's why C&Ds are the worst. <laughs> uh, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, apparently you do C&Ds in your spare time. I, I haven't done one before, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, I'm all over it. Shutting down people. <laughs> yeah. Publishing if, me. <laughs> if anyone says downtime, not referring to our podcast, you're getting a C&D. I make 0.2 cents. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's see what happens. Like we, we've got to keep yeah. an eye on this because this is going to become yeah a trendsetter, be or it's going to become one of the worst things that's ever happened to digital board gaming. <laughs> yeah, or nothing because everyone goes back to normal and just plays games in person again, and it doesn't change much. But we will yeah. see. Yeah. Um, that's it for the news this week. So let's move on to games we've been playing. Yeah. Ooh. Good stuff. Uh, could be all, could be new, could be everything, could be anything. Who knows? You're about to find out. It's the stuff we've been doing the past seven days we want to share with you. So, Chris, as always, do you want to go first? Why, certainly. So, Why, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, mate, certainly. Why, certainly. So, this okay. one comes with a bit of a preamble and a pre story. Because I had a really odd week. So, you know, uh, after last week's recording, I had a meeting at like 8, 8.30 at night. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so at the end of the meeting, one of the guys who was involved, when I'm on my video cam, I have my board game collection behind me, right? And at the end of the meeting, the guy says, pause, let everyone else leave. And we ended up just talking board games in shop for like 20 minutes. Because <laughs> you can nice. see like my big... F off box of subterra on the top. And as we're sitting there chatting away, I didn't realise that he's an enthusiast as well. I mean, not gonna lie. We, I was really enjoying the conversation. It's not how I expected the end of that meeting to go. Made a friend. Yeah, but he was telling me about a friend of his that basically started their own little board game shop over the COVID period, just as a bit of a side hobby. So he's still working and stuff. A uh, company called Games on the Rock. I was like, all right, yeah, awesome. You know, I'm happy to look into this. And as I'm browsing this guy's website, first of all, Prices, pretty good. He had uh, cartographers in there, I think, for £20.50. He had uh, Gloomhaven draw the lines. Spoiler alert, that's what I bought. And that came in about £3.50 under Zatu Games. Nice. So it's like really limited stock, don't get me wrong, but it's like a one-man operation whilst working from his garage. So I was like, yeah, all right, Gloomhaven, I'm going to buy this in Impulse, why not? And the guy ends up calling me on, uh, I think it was on a Wednesday night, at 9 o'clock, he calls me in the evening. Just to issue my billing address and shipping just not aligning. So he's called me up to fix it. But then he ended up just starting chatting to the guy. It was like, really nice guy. Talking shop with him as well. And so I just thought I'd want to give them a shout out. Because I don't usually buy from those small independents, as usual. Usually you go to like your Zatus, your Magic Madhouse, you know. Please don't buy an Amazon. Mm. For anyone listening, please don't buy an Amazon. The risk of no. counterfeit is so damn high that it's just not worth it for the free £5 you're going to save. Yeah. But like the whole experience, man, I was like, this is... Oh my god! You know, I'm not, I'm not used to this. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was being wined and dined while doing my shopping. I was like, "Oh, this is nice, actually." Yeah. Awesome. But yeah, so Gloomhaven arrived. Draws the line. I've not yeah. played. I've not Obviously, played. Not Gloomhaven. The the fifty pound smaller, like introduction to Gloomhaven. Basically, they did. It's basically a standalone version of it with twenty five scenarios. It's like I almost see it as more of like a streamlined one and done campaign from the Gloomhaven world, yeah. Rather yeah, than like being Gloomhaven, which is this big overarching universe, is kind of how this comes across. But man, the attention to details like we talked about box layout earlier, right? And box design. This game is a 10 out of 10 
for box design and user friendliness. And that's nice. what I want to talk about. I'm not even going to, like, I've not played the game. I can't talk about the game. But just from an opening the box perspective to browsing the components, oh my God, it's amazing, dude. I, like, I really hope, <laughs> like, I'll, like so please chime in at any point about how Gloomhaven does it. Because I've heard stories about Gloomhaven being very finicky and fiddly to, to set up uh, and put away. I'll, I'll just say it now. I'll just say it now. Like, the, the Gloomhaven box is maybe a foot deep. That's right, deep. Uh, and it just comes with nothing. It's just baggies, and you just put things in, and you just chuck it all in a big box. So I've got an I, I've got an aftermarket insert. I've got the basically wooden one which you put together so that you can organize stuff. But it, essentially, the Gloomhaven box is they just couldn't. It's expensive enough as it is. Like with the amount of stuff in it, they they couldn't like do a valid insert as well. So it's just like a hundred baggies, and just chuck it all in a big old box and hope it doesn't get mixed up. But yeah, that's why I bought an aftermarket insert. So with that frame of reference. How's Jaws of the Lion? It's absolute opposite. <laughs> it's absolute opposite. So like, the first thing I noticed is like the lid doesn't sit on f- comfortably to begin with. There's almost like the lid sits up about half an inch with the shrink wrap holding it in place. And I was like, that, that's bad design. But no, it's because of where you've got all the cardboard sprues, all the tokens. Once you remove all those tokens, then the box sits flush. So they've actually allowed mm. a bit of extra space to accommodate once you get rid of the cardboard that it will then sit properly. It's like, man, cool. that is like a good level of forethought there. And you crack it open, you're like, all right, here we go. We've got a learn to play guide, we've got a glossary, we've got a welcome to Gloomhaven, and two scenario books. And the whole game is done with the scenario books being in map tiles. So you yeah. crack open a scenario book, you play it on the map tile. But like, just stupid things like, like you just got a single one page document, right, which explains all the different pieces and paper. This is like, stop, read this before you do anything else. Big red box, big red writing. You can't help but notice it and you can't help but read it. And it actually then gives you tips on how to organise the game, how to break down the components, how to store them. So that way future games, when you open it, it's all completely open, play in five minutes, not open, fiddle around with it for half an hour to get set up. That's cool. I love stuff like that. It's like Mm. they've thought so far ahead that they're like, okay, how can we make this get to the table as quick as possible for this campaign? Like, it just doesn't take any effort. Like for me, this is such a beautiful one pager telling me how to organise my stuff and no effort. Yeah, I, li- I like it when they. Um, I played Parks the other day. I'm not going to talk about it today, but on the side of the box, it's printed how to put things back in the correct way. I, I love that. Yes, yeah, you're right. Like having a thing that's just like this goes here, this goes here, and like I'd, I'd packed it away within like thirty seconds, just following this little diagram. Really good. I do really appreciate that kind of uh, stuff. And it does seem to be more and more increasing these days. And that's kind of why I wanted to mention it, because for me, it's like, that is, like King and Rush, I enjoyed the game, but putting that away and taking that game out is the worst. I yeah. Honestly, I packed it away the other day, and it drove me mad the way it's organised, especially after opening and touching and playing with this. I'm like, this is just, I just need to say it, that more people need to do this stuff. You know, like box design and user friendliness are a huge impact on whether people remember your game being good or bad. Consider yeah. it at least. If you can't afford it, fine. But at least think about it and show that you're like aware of your customer's time. But anyway, that's just that's just the opening page. And you go through and it's like, oh yeah, you get to the glossary. It's like, hey, if you open the box for the first time and want to learn how to play, read the learn to play guide. This is just a reference guide. And it's like it's really clever at forcing you to go to the right places to then yeah. put you through that like learning and training that you have to go through. And I just, oh man, it's just like they use tuck boxes to hold the miniatures and stuff in. And there's like certain tuck boxes that got stickers on so you know that you can't open them just yet. It was just like, this yeah. is just, this is an absolute treat to open. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I, I, I am a kid in a sweet shop right now. I'm just opening this, but I've opened it again while we're chatting and reminding myself that actually this just feels the best. Nice. I do need to pick it up. I also need to actually finish Gloomhaven. But it does do a lot of the same similar stuff, you know, the tuck boxes and everything. And there's quite a few... Um, I like how in the in the main Gloomhaven box is just a, a, a big side box. Well, not even a side box. One was hidden. It's just with a big old B on the side. It was just, this is box B. We will tell you to open it when it's time. And that is it. And it's like, well, when... What? 
<laughs> and there's like four things that are like that. It's just in the box. It's all it's just like, don't touch this. Like, do this stuff first. And then maybe later, who knows, you can open this thing. Uh, so they yeah, they did start doing some of that. But yeah, the, the cost and size was just too prohibitive in, in Gloomhaven. I think, um, I mean, Frosthaven did exceptionally well, but I'd like to see more of the Jaws of the Lion size stuff that's more accessible, that's, that's easy to play. And it lets them do a lot more of this uh, cool, you know, insert, layout, get to the table kind of stuff. Because, I mean, Gloomhaven is, you, you basically need to spend another 20 to 60 quid on an insert to be able to play it in any sort of efficiency. Otherwise it takes an hour to get up, set and run in. Like mine's probably about 10, 15 minutes now, but I've got the, you know, wooden special built insert stuff. You shouldn't have to buy that for a game to make it okay to play. <laughs> no. And that's one of the biggest complaints I hear about Gloomhaven. So to see them address yeah. it with this. Yeah. You it listen to great. feedback and like, ah, I mean, it made me more excited to play it knowing that, that it was that well-planned and well-thought out. It, yeah. it, it, nice. kind of, it kind of got the hype building up. I'm like, oh my God, if they've thought this much, just about the design, what about the game itself? I'm like, <laughs> woof. Yeah. So, you know, like, I went from having no expectations to now having a little bit of expectations. I'm like, okay, that's nice. great. So, yeah. I, just... yeah. I will say, yeah, the core gameplay in Gloomhaven is really good. And to see that they've just improved everything around that is sounds amazing. The miniatures are decent quality. All the yeah, way they've yeah. tucked away, all the character stuff has been tied in. I'm still a big fan of standees, not going to lie. I love miniatures, but also I, I love a good oh, standee. God. The art is better. There's no painting required. The cost comes down. It takes less storage space. It yep. is hugely impactful. Nice. And uh, yeah, man, yeah. yeah. Oh, so look forward a, to hearing you uh, actually play it. <laughs> on the topic of treat yourself... Yeah, as I said, this week was very much a treat yourself week. Yeah. Nice. All right. Cool. Do you want to do your video game before I pop off? Or shall I do a board game first? Do you know what? Let's let's keep on trend. Get the board game in, my friend. Get get it in. Board game in. Get your board game in. (laughs) So the game we played most of this week was Fort from Leader Games, the makers of Root. So Fort is a, it's a two to four player deck building game, a much smaller box than Root. It's under 30 quid, nice, easy to play little box. Uh, you play as kids, you try to hoard toys and pizza to make your fort awesome and then play Amazing. with your friends. Yeah, play with all your pals and you either, you either win by getting crap loads of victory points or you improve your fort to the highest fort level and everyone wants to play with you. The, first of all, the theme, really good. <laughs> Such a cool little... <laughs> yeah, like, it does sound theme. like they've hit the theme on the head, yeah. Uh, yeah, like all the cards are just kids. And there's like five different suits of cards. And the suits are like bookworms or super soaker kids or skateboarders and things like that. Um, all uniquely named. So like I'm playing Kitty or Spud. And um, yeah, you, you create like combos with the cards you've got. It's kind of a, yeah, kind of, I guess, a basically deck builder in that way. Like you draw your hand and then you see what you can do with that hand before discarding your cards. And at the end of your turn, you draw your hand up again. Um, but yeah, the theme's really cool, man. It's just really fun to just be a kid playing around in forts and stuff. And just the fact that the two resources are toys and pizza, it does just make it really fun. When you play a card, you'd be like, well, I'm just going to take three pizza and then I'm going to copy two toys off of you. And it's just, uh, it's a bit more interesting than, you know, South, you know, generic token aid. Yeah, token yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to grab this piece of potato and then we'll get these wine bottles like toys and pizza. Everyone loves toys and pizza. True that. Yeah. Uh, it moves along quite quickly. Uh, I think we played about four times already in the day and a half. <laughs> which is pretty good for us because we don't normally just sit and play the same game again and again. Every new turn, you get new cards, which is really good. So on your little player board in front of you as well, um, it has the turn order and basically everything you need to know. So it's like super easy if you, you know, you just tell people to look down, step one, two, three, four, five, you run through it. And one of the steps on that turn is recruit a card. So you can grab a kid from the park which is the... Uh... Careful when you're phrasing there. Yeah, no, yeah, no. Well, you're kids as well. So you're a kid and you're going and grabbing a kid from the park. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 
So yeah, you yeah, recruit you recruit yeah. you recruit a kid from the park, yeah. You're gonna grab some kids from the park <laughs> to come and play with you. But what's cool is like the cards in your hand, uh, obviously with the different suits, when you play a card, you might play a kid, and if he's a super soaker suit, uh he might have a oh gain one pizza per super soaker, and then you can tuck same suits underneath that card to then get more bonuses. So then it's like getting same suits, but also powers to increase your fort and that kind of stuff. Like the whole mechanism is quite cool. The way that you actually like improve and get points and stuff. But then with the cards that are left in your hand, you've got, uh, when you start the game, you've got two best friends. So your best friends have got a star on them and you put them straight in the discard pile because you can't lose them because they're your best pals. But for everyone else that you don't use that turn, you turn them around and you put them in your yard garden for the uh, British people and you put them basically in front of your board and they're facing outwards. So what essentially happens is then on everyone else's recruit turn, instead of taking from the park, they can grab kids from your yard oh, as well. Oh, no. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it, the, 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 the thing in the book is like, well, you didn't, you know, you didn't play with these mates this turn. So they've just gone to like wander around. And if somebody else has a really dope fort that they want to go visit, like they can just go off and play with them instead. So you might lose some of your like powerful cards if it happens to be a turn where you really want to do something else and you have to drop one of your, your you know, one of your cards, like instrumental to combo, if you're dropping it down and be like, well, I couldn't use it this turn. And now he's just hanging out in my yard. And then your opponent might be like, well, I want him over in my fort because he gets he generates crap loads of pizza. Oh, munch, get munch in here to get me some pizza. And they take the, the player from you. And there's a really cool way that I've not really seen many other deck builders be like, you can build and destroy decks by have, having your cards removed from you as well if you don't use them. Um, really, really interesting. Really, really good like decision space based on that. Like, Because sometimes it is just you have to use, you might have like one boss card, but you maybe this turn like if you're you can only hold four pizza and four toys so it's like really limited and if you if you have to you know if you're full on pizza and you need toys to upgrade your fort then you have to play a card to do either toys or do something else and that might mean dropping all your like really cool pizza kids into the yard and then they just get taken and then they go play with someone else and your fort is like slightly worse um it's a really at two players, it's a really interesting back and forth between trying to make this point building for upgrading engine of kids to play around with, but also not, you know, not losing them because you can't use them. Like if you just grab all the most powerful cards, none of the suits will match and then all your best cards will get taken because you can't play more than one suit a turn. Uh, it's like really interesting take oh. on a deck builder. Um, and it's, yeah, not, I've got quite a few deck builders and it's not something I, I think I've seen before in that sort of really quick interaction. And it does play quite quick. It's literally like you play your card, you play your things underneath. Any opponent can then try and follow that action. So if I grab a pizza, you can play a card of the same suit, grab a pizza. I recruit a card, discard my best friends. Cards I don't use go into my yard. And it takes like a couple of minutes, like not even a minute really. Uh, it's quick back and forth. And yeah, really good fun. Highly recommend it, I'd say. It's a, a nice cheapy box of stuff uh art is really good really unique theme and a really good take on a on a deck builder so well done later games which is quite games. it's quite impressive man like deck building is a very crowded space so hearing that mechanic when you're explaining about taking them off each other like yeah. i'm on board for that because normally like take that in deck builders isn't that prevalent uh, it always feels a bit like ah oh, you've ruined my combo it feels bad yeah and while in that one, it didn't sound like it felt bad at any point. It felt more like just a tactical decision to make, like, almost like a suboptimal turn to protect the cards that you need, compared to just going like hyper efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not really like it's not like take that at all because it's like I know like oh, if I you know I can I can either use the card so that I discard it into my personal discard pile, but then that might not be efficient. That's that's you're on about. But if I really need to do this move and use these cards. Then they're going to go into my discard pile, but then this really good card, which might be great my next turn, I then have to just leave in the yard, and then he might go play with you, and then I'm screwed. Like it's a really good balance between trying to do, you know, what you want to do versus trying to prevent your cards from being stolen. But then maybe you drop a good thing in your yard when there's a really good thing in the park, so then you know they're going to go for the park card, and then your hand. I was safe, thinking kind of thing. this, it yeah, now yeah, gets yeah. a bit like metagamey. It's like, yeah. like, do you force somebody to take a piece of your combo, knowing that they now have to use it every turn? We're just going to take him back, you know. 
Like yeah. kids, kids are going to flip back and forth, aren't they? You know, that's a yeah, the theme exactly. sounds on point, man. Like even like those oh, mechanics yeah. you're describing. I, I'm trying to work out if that was theme first and mechanics built in after, or was that mechanics first and the theme just fits so well. I mean, it's it's really good and telling that you can't really tell. It's like it does fit the theme so well that like you know if you, cards you don't use the kids are just going to amble about in the street and then they might be attracted to somebody else's like fort they built in their garden it's like really cool um yeah we really enjoyed it we really enjoyed it I played it quite a few times now so but that's it yeah yeah really good it's a cool little box i'd be interesting to see how it could plays at four players i think that would be quite interesting but um yeah two players really good fun back and forth highly recommend fort by leader games um i'm mean, just gonna quickly mention i started yakuza Kiwami won. It's a good game. Uh, I'm going to talk about it. It's old. It's when? a really well. It's, it's a remake of the first one. They re like the Yakuza okay. Kiwami Kiwami yeah. one and Kiwami two. They remade the first and second ones using the Yakuza zero and Yakuza six engines respectively. Um, okay, that's but it's still up. it's still old games. I do have stuff to say, but I'm going to save it for another time. So, what have you been playing yesterday on Valde? Valentine's Val Valheim Day. It was Valheim Day <laughs> for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I decided to jump in on the new hotness because it sounded like a really good game. And they sold a million copies last week. Uh, yeah, beginning yeah. to see why, Sam. Beginning to see why. It's That's good fun. It's uh, okay. So let's let's look at crafting games and those sort of like survivalist games. The most frustrating part is normally getting enough food and water to stay alive so you can actually play the game and do stuff. They've looked at that, gone, hmm, how can we remove this from being a pain in the ass? So instead of food keeping you alive, different foods now increase your health meter and your stamina meter. So you could not eat a single thing in that game ever, but your health is only ever going to be a small percentage. They've now tied the food mechanics into increasing your health, which you then need to prepare for bigger battles. Which, first of all, I love that. I love that. Playing the raft with my brother recently, we had entire... We, had, we must have had about an hour at one point, but we just committed to grinding food and preparing and cooking and fishing and getting ourselves to a point where we could go on adventure without worrying about a hunger meter. The guys who've made this game, they've seen that mechanic and gone, nah, we don't like it. Get rid of it. Doesn't matter. You know, you can never starve to death and you can never dehydrate to death. Which is just really nice, first and foremost. Yeah, they are the worst bits about those games, really. Yeah, that's my least favourite part. Because it makes the game feel longer without adding much value to me. This is the only thing, that's the thing I really hate about the forest and the thing that annoys me about the raft. They make the game feel longer because I then have to spend time committing to keeping food and staying alive. And it doesn't actually make the game more fun. It just makes it take longer to achieve anything. Yeah, my time is precious, I'm not going to lie. Full grown adult, I've got responsibilities. <laughs> I can't just sit there playing games for eight hours a week, you know. No, Believe it or not, not, I do other things. So the way they had with the food mechanic in that game, I was a big fan of. And I, even like the, the amount of depth they start going into the crafting side as well. I can see why it's gotten this much praise so quickly, because the combat is actually skill based combat for start. The the way that the blocking is done, the way the different weapons are done, the way that you can do dodge rolls and stuff like that. The game is not forgiving. The enemies are hard as shit. I got killed by a boar. Right, so the boars are one of the first wild creatures you find. And I pissed one off because I missed my bow and arrow. And he started hunting me down. But I hadn't eaten enough food, so my health was absolutely minimal. And this boar chased me for about a minute and a half before finally killing me. Because I was unarmed, didn't have any weapons, and I was killed That's by the amazing. weakest enemy in the game. That's pretty I, funny. I deserved it. I deserved it, mindful. But like, that's what I mean. But like, the game was quite unforgiving, but in different ways. It's not unforgiving in the, oh yeah, well, this meat is going to drop too quickly, and that then punishes you. The enemy variety as well, because it's all based in Norse mythology. So like, you start off and you're in the meadows. It's all cute and fluffy. And it's like, oh look, there's some deer and there's some boar. You know, oh we've only got our fist to begin with and a leather rag let's go find some wood on the floor and stone on the floor you know that sort of like really generic kind of survivalist game so it starts mm. off a little bit generic not gonna lie and then quickly throws that generic out of the window like we at one point got attacked by a troll it wasn't a boss by the way this is just a random troll 
it was about six times the height of our characters. It was throwing stones at us. It absolutely soaked up arrows to the face. Because at one point I was running away from it and I was like, 30 arrows to the face, still didn't die. And, oh man, it was, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. I can see why it's gotten this, yeah. this much yeah. attention this quickly. Because it's it been ta- a, yeah, it's been the massive thing this week, right? It's been crazy. Did you did you um, get to any of the bosses? I know yeah, a couple in the yeah. Couple like I've been touching on the overworld stuff and the crafting stuff. The boss fight, man. Back to that skill based gameplay. That boss was the first boss in the game. He was a bit of an ass. Yeah. 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 Me and my brother sitting in the spears, basically had to take it in turns, tanking the damage and try to dodge attacks, while the other one ran away to eat some food to try to get the health high enough to be able to come back in. It was pretty cool, nice. man. Like the animations were really good in the boss fights. The way they attacked and the way the AI worked was really well done. You know, the way I'm trying to describe this game, it was an MMO without the MMO part. Is the best yeah. way to describe it. Like we so kept you couldn't into randoms. It was just you two. Uh, we set up our own server just to play okay. ourselves, but you can join multiplayer servers. And, okay, attention to detail. So let's say you set up your own server with a group of friends. You can choose to have on your map that you are visible or invisible to other players on the server. So there's an entire PvP element that you can choose to add or remove, depending on how you want to play with your friends. So if you decided, actually, you and nine of your friends wanted to have a bit of, like, a two-clan mindset, so you're two groups of five, you could actually then decide to make your map invisible to other players and then actually have a PvP element where you can start taking down people's bases and start attacking them, stealing their resources. And it's just such a small bit of attention to detail nice. having that on the map. Yeah, that, yeah. Like, I really appreciated that. It was annoying because I had to then disable the setting to be able to see my brother on the map because we're not playing PvP. But like, just It was a very fun and cleverly made game. Yeah. And for an early access game as well, that is going to get better very quickly. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like I think I saw there's five bosses in it currently, but it's, it seems like a lot of people are having fun with it. Um, it's like the yeah cross between like Rust and Valhalla kind of thing currently, which is, I mean, it sounds really fun. Um, I might have to pop in at some point if people are going to keep playing it. I would recommend it. Like, I uh, recommend the caveat is early access. Whatever we're playing oh, yeah, right yeah, now yeah, is not the final product. Oh man, yeah, we must have played it. We're only going to play it for an hour or so. Originally, the plan was to play it for a little bit, jump into the raft, and yeah, we, we did that instead. We did not play the raft at all. Nope. <laughs> nope. Nice. And for like the 15 quid to buy it as well, it was pretty good value quite quickly. Like the different weapon variety, like the whole Norse mythology actually fits and it matches. You know, Valheim's meant to be a bit before Valhalla, but after Earth. So that almost like the limbo between those two worlds is the best way I can describe what it's meant to be. But then we started getting to a point where we're like, okay, well, now we can domesticate boars and now we can build pens. And now we had our initial house with a couple of beds set up. And then it's like, okay, let's now make like an external area of some staked walls to protect ourselves from mobs in the middle of the night. Yeah. It really yeah. is like an MMO game in a lot of the ways it's built. Like everything you do, right, has. So it, you've basically got an experience bar for your running, your jumping, your sneaking, your swimming, every single weapon. So every time you do something, whether that's cutting down a tree or swimming in the river or sprinting away, that always levels something up as well. She so started uh, like getting that natural like natural stuff, yeah, yeah, progression. yeah. You start getting that reward track, and you're like, oh, hang on a sec. You know, at one point, my brother was doing one thing, so I sat up a spear, stabbing a rock, practicing my spear skill against a rock before the boss fight, being like, come on. Get some cheeky levels. <laughs> I was like, you've got this, man. You've got this. Like When I first got a bow and arrow, I sat there practicing my bow and arrow against random rocks in the distance because it leveled up my skill and also helped me learn to use it. I like, there's wind direction in this game. Like, if you're using a bow and arrow, there's yeah. actually wind direction you need to consider as well. So you can't just fire an arrow and it's going to go straight forward. So you need to go, okay, well, what's the distance? How far have I drawn the bow? What's the wind direction? And I, I, I practiced it a lot, and I started getting some amazing shots, like you know, just shooting birds and seagulls at like a hundred meters range, being like, "Yeah, I'm Legolas, bitches!" You know that sort of. But like, it was really satisfying, dude. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, I'll definitely have to check it out. It does sound like a, yeah, a cool version of one of these one of these games that tend to be all the rage and then die out. But 
Yeah, I think I'll definitely... Uh... May, definitely maybe give it a go. There we go. That's as committed as I'm going to be. <laughs> it took away the most frustrating parts about those games and yeah, replaced yeah, it with a very well made yeah. combat system. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Cool. And like, that's nice. the thing. Like, the Wrath of the Forest, the combat systems were mediocre. Mm. Completely mediocre. This game was like, let's have a good combat system and then make it that survivalist genre linked to it rather than a survivalist game with some action. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I can see why, man. I can see why. I'll, I want to play more. All right. No, that's cool. Well, we'll definitely, if you keep playing it, we'll definitely check in, especially as it evolves. Um, as you say, as the early access now, not too much there, but also kind of a lot of stuff. If there's five bosses and you've only done one, then there's quite a lot of stuff there, I guess. Maybe. We'll see. But It took maybe seven we, um, hours to get to the first boss. So, yeah, there's enough content I mean, to keep you going for a while. Lot. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, maybe we keep on top of this then if you're going to play it. But um, cool. But I think... That sounds good. And that is an end to the show, I believe, unless you have anything else you want to pop on. Nah, nah, I've popped enough. I've popped enough. You know. Popped off about Valheim. Pop, pop, on, pop, pop, pop. Uh, February 14th, V-Day was Valheim Day. Yeah, and the day before that was Gohalla. No, that's not right. That's a bad no, joke. That doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'm going to just ignore that and just going to read out the outro bit. So if you have a question you want to send us, on the show, you can do that. Send us fan mail, send us anything. Contact at downtimegaming.co.uk, where that is up from us this week. If you like what you heard, please subscribe on whatever podcasting app or service you use and leave us a review if you can as well. We super appreciate each and every one. Super handy, super, super, super. Uh, if you want to see more of what we do, head on over to downtimegaming.co.uk. We're also on YouTube if you search Downtime Gaming, Instagram and Twitter at downtime underscore gaming. But with that, I wish you another great week ahead, everyone. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you at the same time next week. It's been a pleasure. See you guys.